by talking a little bit about where your interest in film and photography developed and some of your backgrounds in cinematography. Yes, well, I was, I was brought up with, uh, uh, from the very beginning, with photo photography all around me, uh, black and white photography. Because my father was a cinematographer and a photographer, so he was always pointing a camera at me. And then he would go into this mysterious room called the dark room, which I wanted to understand all about uh, as soon as I could walk. I would uh, toddle upstairs and scratch on the door of the dark room in which he spent a lot of his time processing his photographs. And little by little, bit by bit, he, he showed me the process of uh, black and white photography. I was, he would lift me up and in, in that uh, dark room with a, a red glow from a lamp, a uh, safety lamp, I think it was called, um, he would show me a white piece of paper submerged in chemicals and slowly an image would appear on the, on the piece of paper and that seemed to me like magic. And I wanted to practice the same magic so I begged <laughs> and, and bothered him until a friend gave me a box brownie camera at the age of probably six, maybe five even, and I can, I can still look at those photographs and see uh, and recognize how small I was because the photographs of, of my parents are taken from a very low angle, my natural angle at the time. And little by little he taught me how to develop a film and how to print and by the age of 10 or 11 I was able to make small enlargements. And although I was very aware that there were a few colour films around because my first movie experience was uh, probably Dumbo and then Pinocchio. Um, but apart from that, I knew that my father photographed in black and white. And when he went off to shoot a documentary or a film, it was always in black and white. Occasionally, he would put a roll of Kodachrome through his camera, but my destiny seemed to be in, in black and white and representation of the world around me in, in black and white. And I became obsessed by, by the single image uh, which pho photography represents and, and in movies. I built myself at the age of six or seven a toy cinema out of bricks, very much a toy crude cinema. I imagined it was cin a cinema a little room with uh, a, a hole at one end of it for the screen and I, I would put uh, into the screen area what, were, what my father came back from work with, which was a strip of film, they called it a Sinex strip. It showed a single image uh, 20 times over, printed from very light, zero, to very dark, which was 20. And the cinematographer had to choose the, the ideal uh, density, which he wanted the, the scene to be printed at. I would put that on, on, on the area of what I called the screen and I put a torch behind it and dream myself into the cinema. And I think I've kept that, that dream going since then. Yeah, and I've, I've always practiced photography myself, even up to today. It's, it's a passion of mine. Yes. So going from those early days then, how did that transition to colour happen for you? What were those first experiences like um, making the, the sponsored films, the short films that you were making in the early 60s? Well, I started off in documentary films in, in black and white, 16 millimetres. Uh, I spent a year in Latin America and then I wanted to get studio experience because I didn't want to work on films which depended entirely on reality. So I came back to the United Kingdom and Forgive me if I digress at all, but I, my, f my first movie was really um, quite due to my photography because the, the director who was making a film, Kevin Brown, who was making a film uh, called It Happened Here, and he needed a, a cinematographer and saw my photographs and, and said, hmm, I'd like you to photograph my film, if you will. And that was made on short ends, black and white. And after finishing that, Yes, I got work as a cinematographer in, in um, commercials and documentaries, and some of those were in colour, until I shot my first professional film, which was Peter Watkins' uh, film, Privilege. Right. Um, so before we go on to talk about your feature films, mm. um, have you any um, 
reminiscence about those early sponsored films that you were working on. Um, I'm aware that you worked on one called Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, with your I father. didn't film that. I, oh, that was my father's cinematography. Right. Yeah, that was the only time I worked with him. Yes. Uh, um, sometimes on these uh, sponsored films, I'd have to work with very slow color film, painfully mm -hmm. slow, like 25 ASA. Um, unimaginable for cinematographers today who, who have to make uh, very, uh, have to, I was going to say little effort to get an exposure. Obviously cinematography is not just about exposure, it's about what you do with, with the image. Uh, but we struggle to get an exposure with such slow stocks. And was that mainly um, Eastman Colour you were working on? Uh, I think it was exclusively Eastman Colour. Yes, yeah. there was. There were very few choices. There was Agfa, if I remember rightly, and Fuji didn't exist, and we we didn't have access to Sovcolor, uh, or the maybe there was one other made in East Germany. I don't, rem I can't recall precisely, but the obvious choice was Kodak. Yeah. I think there was um, Geva Color at yes. that time, wasn't there? Yes. But Agfa was part of Geva, wasn't it? Yes, it was, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so during that transitional period then, what you have started out working with black and white and eventually moved into all out color photography. Mm. Yes. Were there any major considerations during that transition? Did your approach change at all? It necessarily changed, but the. the in that period, very often one would hear what sounds like a, s uh, a ridiculous question today. Is this a color film? Is this film suitable for color or is it a black and white film? Really, truthfully, it was probably a budgetary consideration. And uh, there, was, there, was very, um, there was no doubt in, in most producers' minds that, that a movie had to be in color once, once it became practicable to, to shoot in color. I still loved shooting black and white uh, stills, but I don't think I, well, I know that I didn't shoot any black and white after I, I started working in, in movies. I didn't shoot a black and white movie. Mm. Today, I would have loved to have shot one or two. Mm. Were there any of those discussions happening sort of um, around the time of privilege? Because I know there were a number of directors who really wanted to stick with black and white, actually requested their cinematographers to try and get it as black and white as yes, possible. Yes, I'm sure that was the, the case with, with um, the Free Cinema Group, for instance. Um, but I never encountered that. It, um, it was quickly assumed that one would shoot in color. Mm -hmm. And there was only one stock available yeah. for a long time. One, one speed of, one sensitivity of stock. Mm -hmm. So talking about the film stocks, could you um, talk a little bit about your experiences with Eastman Color? Um, obviously there were different stocks uh, being developed around that time, sort of in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, what are your experiences with those changes that would be made, the I don't remember sense? when the fast uh, uh, Kodak stock uh, became available. I, I don't think it was the late 60s. I think it was well into the 70s before it became available, probably the late 70s. You might know more than I do about there it. Was the, the much faster stocks did come in, I think it was 79, 80. Yes, so I'm, um, I'm about right, yes. Yeah. So there was only one stock available for, for mm. a, a major amount of time. Yes. I know there and was a few improvements in colour definition and grain, but yes. did that not really have much of an impact? On uh, the thing that really bothered me uh, was the... F the fact that you might shoot on Eastman Colour, but if the company had a contract with the Technicolor Lab, it was printed a different way. It was not printed on Eastman Colour, it was printed in what they called the imbibition process. And I cannot describe it to you, but it was a kind of dye transfer process. But it looked quite different from your, the rushes that you would have seen uh, in the studio cinema. Come, arriving at the point of uh, grading or timing, as the Americans call it, the film, um, you would see something rather different with the reds heavily emphasized compared to Eastman color. And that, that used to, uh, I must say, annoy me and distress me that one would see the rushes one way and then the film looked different. Well, that's quite interesting, Peter, because um, I'm aware that you, a number of your films were printed by various labs mm. and the IB printing process, which continued in the UK until the early 70s. Yes. 
um, obviously going through technical labs. So there was no uh, negotiation between yourself and the labs between how the final film should look. Did you? Did you? No. If you went to, t if you had to go to Technicolor, or if you went to Technicolor, um, it was going to be printed with the imbibition me method. And I'm not saying that it was a bad method. It just was a sudden change, yep. and you didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. There was only, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was only other one other important laboratory, uh, laboratory, and that was Denham Laboratory yep. at the time. Mm -hmm. There were some small labs, but uh, they wouldn't normally have been engaged in, in printing movies. Yeah. So during before the print stages, during the processing, did you did you work with the labs at that point with Humphreys or any of the other? Smaller I've worked films. with I worked with Humphreys on smaller films, and f uh, f well, from the very outset, with it happened here that was processed at Humphreys, and mm -hmm. they had very dedicated and knowledgeable technicians there. Mm -hmm. But the, the, my my uh, contact with the lab only really occurred at the time of the shooting of the film, the rushes. I would phone them several times a week, but the real contact came at the the printing stage, mm -hmm. which was very much a hit and miss process compared to today. Mm. When I think back on how we uh, graded a film, it was so crude and hit and miss. You'd mm -hmm. sit, and sit in the lab with a technician next to you projecting the cut, the edited cut, um, and the cinematographer would say, this scene looks a bit too light or too blue or too green or whatever, Pr print it darker or lighter, etc. And the, the technician would be making notes, taking note of the counter in front, uh, below the screen so that you could see at which uh, point, precisely which point in the film we were uh, uh, talking about. And then he'd go away for four or five days and do what he thought was necessary. And one would come back as a cinematographer and see some things that look better and some that definitely look worse. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, it's a very precise process. You sit in the, in the theatre, I sit there with a laser pointer, and I say um, all those things that I said to the technician next to me. But of course, I also say, look at the top left of the screen. Can you make that darker or, or lighter? Or look at the face of that actor. Please uh, alter the contrast. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, change the contrast and make a window, and the computer will follow the actor's movements. It, it's, uh, a very gratifying process, whereas the, the old process, although film produced some very beautiful results, uh, was very hit and miss. And the problem with film was also that the, the negative was considered so precious that they would only strike five or six copies of the film from the original negative, and then they'd go and, and make the rest of the copies from duplicate negatives. And the, they, although they told us, oh, you won't be able to tell the difference, that was a, 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 a tall story. I won't say a lie, but it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. It looked much worse. Yes. Well, it's those additional generations, isn't it? It's from the, when you're making those show prints, which uh, toured London, compared to the national distribution prints, um, yes. we've heard from other interviewees that there was a difference between those. Yes, um, big difference. Uh, the contrast would increase, the, the shadow areas would have less detail in them, and the definition would, would uh, go downhill a little bit to the normal viewer, uh, it looked fine. <laughs> but to us cinematographers who knew what the original looked like, it didn't look so fine. Mm -hmm. um, so just to go back, um, so you did work in terms of um, after the rushes were printed, you, you did sit um, oh, yes. in the labs? Yes, I, would be ex I, I expected to go five or six times, yes. possibly more, but generally not more than that. Mm -hmm. But then when it came to the printing stage, that was kind of out of your hands at that point. The well, once we'd agreed on the, on the grading, on the timing of the film, uh, I wouldn't see every copy by any means. Mm -hmm. I might see one show copy. Mm -hmm. And when the imbibition printing process ended, were you more satisfied with the results, say if um, a film went to rank uh, denim for printing? I, I just, I suppose I was perhaps a little inflexible. I expected, I wanted the film to look the way I saw the rushes. Mm -hmm. And it looked different. And I, I'm not for a moment saying it looked worse. It just looked different. And then the, the reds were definitely emphasized. Mm -hmm. And it gained in contrast, I, as far as I remember.
Okay, brilliant. Um, so if, if we can talk a little bit about um, the film stocks then, you've already mentioned that you didn't really notice as much of a difference until the late 70s, early 80s. No, um, there wasn't a choice. There was no. no choice until that time. No. Um, how did you, um, did you recognise those changes and how did it change your work? Well, one could be um, a little bit lazier, I suppose, when the fast stock came out, but the results were not as beautiful as, as the original slower stock, the, the uh, 100 ASA stock as it became in, in tux tungsten. St I, th I believe it stayed the best one, and they never managed to make the fast stocks look as creamy and high definition and as, as beautiful as the slow one. But it, um, we, we were seduced in into using the fast one because it made life a lot easier and a little bit faster in, in lighting mm. uh, because it had so quite a lot more s sensibility. Mm -hmm. yes. um, there have been people in the past who've had an affection for um, the original technical or three-strip process and the colours mm. achieved by that. Do you, would you say that the Eastman colour um, kind of is an improvement on that? Were you more affectionate for the later colours? In I, I, I never had the, the, the chance to use the Technicolors no, process, no. but I saw quite a number of films that were shot that way, and I saw some beautiful results. Uh, I can't, they, they, they are quite different. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that the, it's obvious to me that the uh, Eastman Colour uh, stock allowed you, if you wished, to be more naturalistic and the Technicolor stock was, was slow and required uh, a lot of lighting, heavy, heavy use of arcs in, in the studios, mm -hmm. and bad, bad, really bad weather shooting or shooting at the end of day was, was difficult with, with Technicolor. Mm -hmm. But it looked splendid when it was well handled. Um, okay, so going back slightly, um, you mentioned your work on It Happened Here with uh, Kevin Brownlow yes. and how um, that's partly inspired by your work in still photography. Would you say that your work on It Happened Here inspired Peter Watkins' decision to hire you for privilege? It, pr it probably did, yeah. but I, th I think that my work on um, It Happened Here was obviously the work of somebody who, who didn't know, who had not much experience of lighting. It was made with very simple and restricted means. I had four lamps low of relatively low, low output in, in those uh, uh, f for the duration of the film. We, we shot it on uh, short ends which Stanley Kubrick gave us from Dr. Strangelove, so it was shot on fast stock. It was shot on uh, Tri-X, I think. I think it would, that's the still film version of it. I don't, maybe it was called Double X. It was 250 ASA and didn't look as good as the, the slow stock. <laughs> the same as in color, the slower stocks always look better. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, we were happy to get anything to make that film. Mm. We would have 100 feet uh, uh, or 80 feet or 60 feet, enough for one take. We'd have to take a lot of care. And I had come uh, off a series of documentaries which were shot in a naturalistic way without having to light. Mm. So I knew nothing about lighting. I had my eyes and I knew what I, I w was striving towards, but I, I didn't get very far with it. Yes, I think Peter Watkins seeing that film and talking with Kevin Brownlow, because they were, they were colleagues. Peter Watkins was an assistant editor for Kevin Brownlow mm -hmm. for a few years. And I think that he preferred to work with somebody who had, who wasn't going to bring a lot of baggage of experience with him. Mm -hmm. And Peter Watkins told me straight away that he would like the film to be shot uh, in the Nouvelle Vague way. When I think back on what Nouvelle Vague films looked like, I don't <laughs> they, they were given a certain look by um, the preeminent cameraman of those films, you will have to remind me of his, his name. But the look was uh, a bounce light off the ceiling, giving what 
something that the director's delighted in, very little time required between setups mm -hmm. and being able to pan the camera in any direction at all. But the look uh, is not very interesting. It's just a flat, bounced light. That's what Peter Wat Watkins wanted, and um, I wanted to to do whatever he, he wanted. It was my first chance at a, at a, a real movie, and I didn't have any aesthetic arguments to advance. I thought that was a good idea. Today, I don't think that's a very good idea at all. We nearly burnt down uh, a very important location, beautiful location, Birmingham Town Hall, by, by putting lamps on the ceiling, overheating the ceiling. Uh, you can imagine what might have happened. Luckily, it didn't. We saw the smoke in time. Yeah. And there's an interesting scene in the film um, where you film, was it Birmingham City Football? grounds. Yes. You filmed at the football grounds. Yes. Um, I don't if you remember much about that, how you approached the lighting for that, because it's very theatrical. Yes, well I had a few powerful lights. I, I expect that I had a few arc lights and 10Ks, but, may, but it would have been a few arc lights. It was quite common to use these very heavy uh, and labour-intensive devices requiring two, two, two men per lamp. Um, I, w I used those, but I also had flares. Um, probably, um, I, I don't, I'm ignorant today of what they were made of, but they burnt uh, different colours and they looked very, m they made the scene look expressionistic mm. rather than just naturalistic. Yes. And from what I remember in the film, there's quite a dominant uh, presence of uh, strong blue colours in the character, the main character, Stephen, and I think later in the film he's wearing um, oh, the choice of his clothes. Yes. yes. Um, and they're very bold in this film. And yes. How much was that uh, planned, or is that from the stock? Because I know... No, that would be a design yeah. um, decision between Peter Watkins and his uh, wardrobe, yes. super, uh, mm. wardrobe person. Mm. But his, his style um, that he required of the actors was influenced, I think, today uh, clearly by... Uh, Brisson, mm. and he wanted to use uh, as many amateur actors as possible, and those professionals he tried to reduce to uh, an amateur. N I don't mean in a bad sense. He wanted them to look to feel naturalistic and not to, to have any uh, drama school feeling behind them, and he wanted the same of the, ph of the photography, for it to be naturalistic and not to have very much uh, shape or, or he didn't want to, it to, to be noticeable. That's, I think that's the best way I can put it. Yeah. If somebody asked me today to do that, I, I would say I think I, I'm the wrong casting because that doesn't interest me. Um, but I was excited by the, by the mm -hmm. chance to photograph that film anyway. Yes. Uh, there are a few moments in the film as well where we see a number of black and white still images throughout. And there's a sequence at the end which is um, it's Stephen's final moments. It's a silent um, uh, black and white clip. Was, was black and white used in the film to kind of add that documentary? I'm sure we so did. You know, I can't, it's so long since I've seen the film, yes. I can't rec recollect those scenes anymore, but I, I would have thought that we did. But I cannot be sure. It's, t it's possible that they were just printed in black and white. And the, there were a few occasions when I was shooting movies subsequent to that in which black and white was called for. And I always arrived at the decision that it was better to shoot in colour yes. and to print it in black and white. Mm -hmm. Yes, one of those films I believe we'll be coming on to later ah. on, which was Valentino, I think. I see, yes. You moved on to. Um, so sort of moving on to, um, which I think was your next film, Charlie Bubbles. Yes. Um, with Albert Finney. Um, from watching that, the version that I had to see, that's a very muted film. There are a lot of browns and it's... Um, not as expressionistic as the previous film. Uh, could you talk to us about, about were, were special techniques employed for that film? I or? don't think any special techniques were, no. were employed for the film at all. No. The, the look of it would have come from the choice of locations, the time of year when we were filming probably was the autumn, and f the colours chosen for the, the clothes. Mm -hmm. But no special processes at, at all were used. I think I'm sure, pretty sure, my approach was as naturalistic as as I could make it. 
uh, given the, the, the slowness of the, f the film stock we were using and the fact that we were shooting in, in locations, sometimes very small cottages mm. uh, in, in the north of England. Yes. Um, there is one particular sequence I'd like to pick up on, and that's where um, Albert Finney's character, Charlie, is watching a number of video screens. There's, yes. there's nine video yes. screens, um, all in colour of his house. Yes. How, how was that technique achieved? With a lot of effort, I think. <laughs> We had to film each uh, each uh, angle that the the cam cameras on the uh, video surveillance system uh, were, were were showing. It was they were all filmed individually, of course. So it took a lot of thought and calculation to get it to get it the timing right, so that the character could walk from one screen to another. Apparently, mm. but that wasn't the fact. We it was all created, and the person doing it. Uh, who was given the task of working it all out was uh, uh, a very, an untried uh, director who was in fact Albert's assistant because Albert, I'll tell you his name in a moment, uh, Albert Finney, uh, because he was acting in it, wanted somebody he could refer to to reassure him that his performance was in, in the right, of the right way, the right tone and was good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so he chose somebody he'd met in the theatre, I think, that, that the director had worked uh, as an assistant at the Royal Court. His name was Stephen Frears, and that was his first film experience. Yeah. And he, he, is he was responsible for setting up the f and, and timing and editing the, the video sequence. Mm. And um, so what was your experience working with Albert Finney like in terms of um, wanting to um, see what was coming out through the camera. Was he involved in that? Was he? Did you work quite closely with him? I worked qu closely with him, and I, it was one of the most uh, delightful and charming experiences that I'd, I've had in, in all my time in films. Things were much more relaxed in those days, even for a film like like Charlie Bubbles, which I'm sure was e was evidently to evident to the producers that it was not a very commercial film. We had 12 weeks to film it in. You'd probably get f four or five today. Mm -hmm. So things were much more relaxed. Uh, yes, he was involved in, in, as far as I remember, in, in choosing the, the, the angles which we'd shoot from. But he relied very much on, on the camera side, to the, myself and the camera operator, mm -hmm. to decide how to structure the scene. I mean, that, that pr takes me off on a side tack, which you might not be interested in, but um, in those days I, I uh, took for granted the, the culture of filming in this country, which, was, which said that the cameraman had to work with a camera operator, whatever the type of film. Today I much prefer to operate myself. We were called, and still are called, by a ridiculous expression in this country, lighting cameraman something that I hate, as if that's the only thing we do. Whereas I, I firmly believe that part of our job is to decide which lens to use and where to put the camera, and that's nothing to do with the operator, really. The operator's there, as far as <laughs> I'm concerned, to, to help and give his or her opinion, uh, which will be listened to, but the first uh, decision about where to put the camera and which lens to use should come either from the director or from the cinematographer. And if, if you've arrived at the stage of being a director of photography, it's because you've got something to say about the style of the film, and it shouldn't just be down to a, a camera operator. So we were, and I accepted it as part of the uh, normal language of film, and, the, 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 and how, how films were made. The cameraman did um, let the, very often let the operator choose, and I would never do that today. But I, I was fortunate enough to work with a good operator, but I've got my own language, yes. and which is not the same as a, a camera operator who might decide that he prefers to everything to be in the middle or never in the middle, silly, silly things like that. But we've got, all got our, uh, our own way of, of doing yes. things and how to translate a scene into imagery. Fantastic. Um, 
So, following um, Charlie Bubbles, you then worked on um, A Midsummer Night's Dream with Peter yes. Hall, which yes. I believe was um, one of his early films, obviously uh, being a theatre director. As a theatre director, how did Peter Never. sort of uh, approach that film and s were there any special instructions? How? Yes, it was a, it was a, a tricky en enterprise for m many reasons. I got on very well with, with Peter Hall. I, I'm pretty sure it was his first film. And he decided to shoot it all on location, within reach of th of uh, the theatre at Stratford and Avon, because the actors were, were sometimes engaged in a production in the evening. Uh, I don't know how that was possible because m most of our shooting was at night, being Midsummer Night's Dream. But anyway, for whatever reason, he wanted to be close to Stratford on Avon, and he wanted to shoot in a naturalistic, uh, a naturalistic fashion in a real wood. And unfortunately, the production was tied, for some reason, to pine wood. And we, that meant we had to take all the electricians and all the equipment from the studio. And that meant that the lamps we were going, I was obliged to use were basically pre-war and very heavy indeed, very heavy. And the, the poor electricians had to struggle over roots and through bushes with lamps which were far too heavy for the, for the film we were shooting, really. Well, we, we did our first night's work in a fairly conventional way. And looking at the rushes the next day, Peter, what, Peter Hall became fearful of the film looking conventional and said that he wanted to shoot everything handheld. On the other hand, the, the, he wanted to do the full text. That was part of his... Uh, strong belief that Shakespeare shouldn't be cut and that meant that many of the shots were going to be static shots held by with a camera held by a camera operator who began to tremble <laughs> at the end of the dialogue the speech and it, it the film well the film bless him Peter Hall he was a, a wonderful stage director but maybe not such a gifted film director <laughs> Uh, the film is not filmic, even though it was filmed handheld. I think it's uh, w an example of a film with a marvellous cast <laughs> and a wonderful text that's a terrible <laughs> film. <laughs> yes. Uh, all the text is in there, isn't it? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's some, some quite interesting lighting in the film. I know we have a lot of cameras sort of um, lights in the background giving that kind of, yes. um, sort of magical... Yeah, um, trying to. Yes. <laughs> It's not something I'm proud of, but I enjoyed shooting it because we had such a wonderful cast. Mm, yes. Um, and filming on location, sort of um, into the evenings, um, a lot of lighting required? I yes, a lot of point. lighting. It was a, re it was a struggle, actually. Yeah. Stock was still slow in those days. It was probably... I, I wonder if it had got to 100 ASA by then. But if it had, that's all it was, mm. 100 ASA in a forest with rain at night, a real struggle. Mm. Not, not a pleasant experience from that point of view. It was Helen Mirren's first film. We had a, a fantastic cast that made it a pleasure and Peter Hall was just a very cultured and lovely man to be with. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Some great performances in that. Yes, yeah. but somehow a, a, a failure as an enterprise. I think if you're going to film Shakespeare, you have to, if you're going to make it into film, Oh, you have to depart from from Shakespeare a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's why, for me, the best the best Shakespearean f uh, film translation is um, Kurosawa's yep. Throne of Blood, because mm -hmm. he hadn't didn't have to deal with the language. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are we doing? Twenty one. Twenty one left. Oh, brilliant. Um, <coughs> so, sort of moving on. Um, so you worked second units um, on Charge of the Light Brigades. Yes. And um, uh, some of the interviews with David Watkin mention um, certain techniques employed that he wanted a different look between certain scenes shot in England and Russia. What part of the filming were you involved in? I was only involved in the part in, uh, which was meant to take place in the Crimea, but we shot in Turkey. And I really said yes to the film because in those days I wanted to have as many different kinds of experiences as possible. And uh, I knew Tony, Tony Richardson 
uh, was making bold films. He'd, he'd given the money for it happened here. So I said yes straight away. And David Watkin um, told me that he was going to shoot the film in scope, in cinema scope, but he was going to use pre-war lenses, uncoated lenses, to give it an antique look. I don't, to be honest, I don't think he made a wise, a wise decision. <coughs> but that's, he was a bold man. Uh, and he tried many interesting things in it through his career. Mm -hmm. so, and he was a, a lovely person yes. with a good sense of humour. So we used these uh, lenses. I, I don't remember exactly what, I think they were pre-war cook uncoated lenses. And then on top of those was placed a, an anamorphic, anamorphic lens, which would squeeze the image. So there, were, there was a lot of glass in front of the camera. Mm -hmm and a lot of flares and foggy look. Mm -hmm. I was involved in filming the, the battle scenes. And I spent three months, uh, many days, in a thick pall of tire smoke. Still alive, but I'm sure it didn't do me any good at all. Um, so before we move on to the next film, could we talk a little bit about um, uh, lenses and uh, achieving those kind of sometimes dreamy mystical sort of looks um, through the camera um, using different lenses and mm. gauzes and yes. such such like. Um, how, did you use them much in your career? Uh, I think in, in my early colour films I was very influenced by uh, a, a, co a colleague I had a lot of respect for, uh, Walter Lasley. I had been his assistant on a documentary and we stayed friends. And he shot everything through with a gauze in front of the camera. He thought that that gave it a more gentle look. Well, it, gave, it did give it a more gentle look. But I veered away from that uh, a few years later. I, I, I didn't like the romantic look that a gauze gave. But I did put a fairly open and not very strong net in front of the camera on several films. I don't recall exactly when I stopped doing that. But he had given me some uh, stockings which his father had brought from Germany, pre-war Dior, Dior stock stockings. I still got them, but never haven't touched them for 40 years, I think. So I, I always liked a, a good lens, and that was the reason why uh, in most of my earlier films I shot on a rack over Mitchell camera because they had to my mind, the best, the best lenses, although the camera was very bulky and the, the operator, and thank goodness I wasn't operating in those days, didn't really see what the lens saw. Mm. He, he worked with a, I have to say he and not she or she because there were so few women in films. Um, he worked with a, an offset finder which didn't really show exactly what the lens could see. It was close enough for medium shots. It was accurate enough for medium shots, mm -hmm. but for closer shots, the operator had to use his experience and judgment as mm -hmm. to what the lens was seeing, which he didn't see. Mm -hmm. But uh, lenses have stayed very important to, to me because that through, them, through the lens passes the whole film. Mm -hmm. all, all the effort and the money that's, be that's gone into making the film goes through the lens, so one had better pay, it, better pay attention to which lens one uses, and they do have different qualities. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about the expertise of the cinematographer, not just the, um, the lighting cameraman, <laughs> so to speak. It's yes, the, it's a question knowledge. of taste, really, yes. yes. Mm. Um, well, that brings us on to uh, Lock Up Your Daughters, um, which I believe you did after Charge of the Light Brigade. Did, um, being a period film, did your work on Charge of the Light Brigade influence that film at all? Kind of, um, I, used I, to working I can never answer the, these questions. I think everything that you experience in life uh, will come out in one way or another uh, if, if you're practicing an expressive craft, whether it's cinematography or, or painting or music. I, I don't think you can divorce life from what, what you do. So I'm sure uh, everything I learned on Charge of the Light Brigade on, and on the previous films uh, came out in one way or another mm -hmm. uh, on my next one. So, in your career, what's, what have been the influences um, 
outside of cinema on your work. Um, obviously, you've mentioned your own still photography, but is there anything else in terms of um, any artists or anything that have kind of influenced your style in any of your films? I never or? try. Well, I never try to make my work look like any particular um, artist in another field because if you're talking about painting or drawing, um, ours has, has been a photochemical process and now it's an electronic uh, process. There's no sense of touching the canvas which you get from painting. So uh, I think it's a, a lost cause to want to make your work look like this or that painter. If you're trying to do that, then you'd, you'd inevitably want to have the color palette given by the locations and the clothes that go to making that paint this or that painter's work look that way. But you'll never get the sense of the passing of time that you get subconsciously when you're looking at a painting. Mm. But yes, painting is, has always been, has become more and more important to me. Mm. I mean, looking at it, looking at paintings, and I, I go to galleries every, every week if I'm in, in a city, er, certainly every week and I see, see as many exhibitions as possible and music has been um, probably also a very important part of my life, more important than painting, but I can't tell you how it's affected my cinematography mm -hmm. and reading too, telling, stor telling of stories mm -hmm. is uh, I think of vital importance uh, to filmmaking and mm -hmm. directors who haven't read any of the classic novels uh, I think make a mistake. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I don't say that they can, won't be capable of making good film, but to, to judge the, what is important in telling a story, I think it, it helps enormously to have read a, mm -hmm. a bit or a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so going from there, in, in the past you've mentioned that you'll read the script before you um, yes. tackle the film, but you don't always come in with an idea every time of what you're going to do? No, I often don't know what I'm going to do. I worked, as, as you may know, with uh, David Cronenberg for uh, 25 years, and he would always say to me the day before, I don't know what I'm going to do, and I would say, David, it's the same for me. I don't know what I'm going to do. Of course, we both had good ideas, uh, I mean, fairly clear ideas, uh, what we were going to do, but it felt as though we didn't know what we were going to do. There were, there are always lots of choices in front of you as a director and as a cinematographer and you mm -hmm. have to make choices which will influence the way you work, uh, especially a cinematographer. Has to, he or she has to have looked at the locations uh, or the sets mm -hmm. and chosen the right e equipment to have, but there are always options on the day of how you can use the equipment and mm -hmm. where you can put the camera mm -hmm. and which lens to use and so on. Uh, very often I'll arrive uh, in at the pre-production point in, in a film, the preparation point, not knowing quite how I'm going to, 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 to approach the film. I've, I need to see the locations, see the sets, if there are going to be studio sets, and talk with the, set, the production designer and the person, the wardrobe person. Before, and put together a kind of mosaic of a feeling about the film and only on the first day do I really s sense how I'm going to do it but one has to establish the style on the first day during the first shot mm -hmm. because the next one has to look part of the film as well mm -hmm. so you can't do different things on every shot mm -hmm. it's got to fit together yes. so that it feels as though it's happening in a short space of time um, so, in past interviews, we've heard that a lot of um, the costume designers, production designers, will often do research, particularly if uh, it's a period film, for example, yes. and you've already mentioned that you work with them when you're on the set. Is there any research that you would do in, um, for a period film, for example? Is there a look you would try and create, or would you shoot what's been produced by the costume and production designer? In a different way, isn't I'm there? trying to think whether I've worked on period films in which I would have done research. I, c I can't th think of any. The last period film that I worked on, I think, um, putting aside Tale of Tales, which um, is not anchored to a sh 
one accurate period um, would have been um, the Cronenberg film, uh, A Dangerous Method. I think that would have been the last one, and I, I'm very familiar with that, with the period. Mm -hmm. uh, the painting, the, the furniture, the jewellery, all of it uh, has always fascinated me, and the music and the literature, so I didn't need to do any research. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> I, I think that I, I spent s some time being uh, complaining about inaccuracies in, in the props on the film. Mm. But, but I shouldn't say more about that. <laughs> but you were helping out in other areas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, your next film, A Touch of Love, um, with uh, Waris Hussein. That yes. was one of a few films you made uh, with Waris at that yes. point. Um, and I believe Waris had worked in television largely uh, prior to that point. So was that experience any different? Did he... Um, tackle the film in a, a different way that you'd um, been accustomed to previously? Well, I think that was the first time that I worked with a, a, a director who was um, experienced uh, in producing lots of material uh, efficiently. Mm. He'd been trained in television, as you say, so he, I think he, would, he always had a diagram with camera angles ready prepared, as you would have to in TV. It was for me, though, the m memorable because it was my f the first film which I'd made in the studio. And I can remember the first day I arrived uh, and caught sight of the microphone, which was on, a, on, on the end of a long pole uh, um, with the boom man perched on the top of a, a sort of trolley. It was a, called a Fisher boom. And he would stand on top of this uh, device which took his feet perhaps four feet off the ground and he had a, a wheel which allowed him to move the, the microphone backwards and forwards. I'd never seen a device like this before. I'd always been on location uh, on my previous films with very short pieces of studio work. Anyway, the, my first problem was how to avoid shadows from the boom because I was still working, if I remind you, with a slow stock and producing naturalistic looking lighting with the slow stock was tough so you had you had to cope with shadows and i quickly learned how to how to avoid uh, boom uh, the sound boom shadows that that's the first memory that i have from it and yes i was working with a, a director who had a plan whereas very often the the other directors i'd worked with up to then relied more on, on the cameraman for the director of photography for deciding where to put the camera and how many angles. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned um, shooting in the studio, coming from working on a lot of locations. Um, so what was that transition like in terms of uh, lighting and what you could get out of the, the image at the end, in the end product? I think very fairly, fairly quickly I grew to love studio work because you start with nothing and you have to create a world mm -hmm. and you, you're able to create your own world in the studio design wise and photography wise so I quickly fell in love with with studio work mm -hmm. that's that's more or less all, all I can yeah. say about that film okay um, so we move on to the John Borman film Leo the last yeah. uh, which I believe followed that um, again, with a very interesting look, a very murky kind of representation of uh, London at that point. Yes. Uh, again, was that something that uh, John Borman was after, or was that something you... No, John, yes. Uh, John Borman was the first really challenging director I, I worked with, with a sense of really uh, what he wanted and the feeling that he had a sort of film in his blood. Mm. Whether he made a successful film or not, I don't mean just this one, but right through his career, mm -hmm. Uh, he was always taking bold, bold steps, and he told me from the outset that he wanted to shoot this film uh, in colour but in black and white. So he, um, together with his production designer, they uh, produced uh, sets on location that, uh, that were all in the tones of blacks and greys and whites. Uh, we even managed to heat or production managed to find a street near Nottingham Gate which was going to be demolished 
and they spray painted the whole street uh, black. And we shot, none of the film was shot in, almost none of the film was shot in the studio. Uh, it's 98% location, so the, all the interiors are in small rooms in a house at the end of the terrace near Notting Hill Gates. So for film purposes, really small by the time you've got the camera and the lights in with a slow stock. Everything in black and white except for the, the actors' faces being the only color in the film. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting challenge. So I th looking back on it today, I was probably too inexperienced for, to work with this director who had worked in Hollywood on mm -hmm. some big productions and, and wonderful films. Mm -hmm. But I, th I found it thrilling to work with a director with a powerful sense of what he wanted. So were there any techniques you employed apart from painting the buildings um, black? Was there anything that you did uh, to kind of bring out that sort of very dark muted? No, I don't no. think so. I just no. lit it the way I felt inside I, I, I wanted to. Um, I'm sure I wasn't very successful at it, but because the film probably doesn't. So uh, every film I've shot, when I see it again, I feel I'd like to reshoot it, as I feel I can do it better now than I could then. The only uh, strange thing I did was, I don't know if it was strange, but the only uh, uh, unusual thing we did was to shoot quite a lot of shots uh, as if the, act, the main character played by Mas uh, Mastroianni, Marcello Mastroianni, the best actor I've ever worked with, uh, he was observing other houses through a uh, uh, pair of binoculars. And I'd never done anything like that before, but of course it's quite commonly done. There's nothing really unusual about it. It was yeah. just for me that it, it was, at the time, unusual. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually what I was going to ask you about next, um, because we see Leo looking into the various buildings from his, uh, his house at the end of the street. Um, so were you employing a variety of techniques with lenses? Ha what are we actually looking into? Because we, we can't tell from um, the film itself. Are you filming from a location and looking into these houses? Yes. 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 I can no ro longer recall precisely whether I, it was all done in camera or whether a mat was put on afterwards. I tend to think that we did it in camera with a lens that didn't really fit the 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 the, the, um, the gate of the camera. In other words, there was uh, there were there was vignetting uh, around the edges. Mm -hmm. I think that's how it's done, but I can't swear to it. Yeah. And would you have um, would you have lit each of those individual rooms? Yes. From the yes. Was that problematic? Yes, it was yeah. very effortful. In those days, if you wanted to shoot on location in color inside an interior, you this was pre HMI, pre uh, lamps that before lamps, which we have today, which uh, work, uh, which um, shine, which illuminate a scene with the daylight colour. Everything was tungsten in those days, apart from the arc light. Mm -hmm. The arc light was an Im immense thing called the brute. It was big, it was very heavy. It was so heavy that two men were, requi were required to lift the head of the lamp off the floor and p place it on the stand of the, uh, which would support it. And then it had an enormous uh, device to convert the electricity from uh, ace, DC DC to AC or the other way around, I can't remember, called a resistance. All, all of this was impossible to use uh, on location inside. Mm -hmm. You couldn't take it into a, a small room. It smoked as well. Yeah. So or, that just meant that you had, uh, the only option we had was a, a tungsten lamp with a blue gel gelatine in front of it, emitting a lot of heat and losing a lot of light because of the, uh, the blue gelatine. Mm -hmm. So I had rooms stuffed with, with lamps uh, and rooms which became very warm. And one day uh, a local youth came along and as a prank touched the controls of the generator, cranking the, the power up beyond the, the capacity of the lamps to absorb it and blew all the lamps. Uh, and that was whilst we were, I had um, illuminated many rooms for one of these shots because John didn't want to cut very often. He wanted to pan from one room to another. So uh, yes, we lost many, many light bulbs. 
due to this young man <laughs> playing a trick. It was no longer seen on set after that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we also managed to burn a house down on that film. Yes, we did. Yeah. Uh, our, main, our main house burnt down at lunchtime. Right. I, I know, I, to this day, I don't know how, why uh, uh, it caught fire, but we ar arrived back from lunch to see the fire engines and the, light and the location slowly <laughs> disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> some of the hazards <laughs> yes <laughs> um could we talk a little bit about you mentioned putting the blue filter on the the tungsten yes uh, lamp. could we talk a bit about the um the arc lights and the brutes and the effect that has on uh, skin tones and colors on the screen and how that's um uh, catered for in terms of uh, the gelatins and things that are used on films I can't tell you a lot about it. And arc lights burnt at um, at daylight colour, 5,600 probably. Somebody else will tell me I'm quite wrong, um, that it was higher than that, that it was bluer than that. Um, it was virtually impossible to, to match uh, the colour of an arc light to the colour of a tungsten lamp with a blue gelatine on it. So we tried to avoid mixing, mixing the two. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very common to have an arc light outside a window shining into, the, into a room and to do the rest of the lighting with tungsten lights uh, with blue gels. But the blue gels, because they were subject to a lot of heat from the lamp, would slowly change color, would fade. And often we wouldn't notice that they'd faded. Mm -hmm. so Yes, many uh, unintentional mm -hmm. uh, colour mistakes were made. <laughs> so used sp sporadically then, I guess. Not, uh, not used as often as you should, really, the, um, the gelatins. Did you try and avoid using them? No, you, ha you had to use them to yeah. make them, to convert them to uh, daylight. The only other option was to convert the window by putting a, an, what we called an 85 gel on the window, but that produced reflections and bulges and bubbles it mm. uh, it was not uh, a very practical thing to to put mm. gelatines on windows although people did it mm -hmm. and i i did it too and sometimes we had perspex made of uh, that the, that color which convert it converted the daylight outside to tungsten color so that when you were inside you could use tungsten lamps with no gels on them mm -hmm but it brought a host of other problems with it. Yes. And it was only after the invention of, of the HMI that we were able to uh, shoot comfortably on location in colour, in s locations inside. Mm -hmm. And the, the HMI, when were they introduced? Was that quite... Probably in the late 80s. Quite, yeah, a long time afterwards. Yes. Um, um, your next film, uh, Figures in a Landscape, um, something which was shot on location again. Was it good to get back on location for that film? It's filmed yes, in Spain, I believe. It was. Um, I, I have to, to be perfectly honest about that film and say that I didn't shoot all of that film. No. Um, it's the only, uh, the only time that I've been released, fired from a film. Uh, I shot the beginning of the film, uh, many of the action scenes, and then the film the film had an uncomfortable history. Joseph Losey, whom I had known for a few years before the film, was a very, he liked working in a very structured way. And uh, he hadn't shot an action film like that for ever, I don't think. Uh, not, not, not in the same way. His, he, his films prior to, that he'd shot in England, prior to that film, were made with uh, a production designer whom I, I never met and I can't remember his name, but um, he used to storyboard the film mm -hmm. and they knew exactly how they were going to shoot each scene. This film was quite different. He'd, uh, a film he was about to shoot had collapsed and he'd lost his crew, including the production designer who went on to immediately to work on another film. So he needed to find a new crew, people he didn't know, and he he had seen my photography and he'd seen some of my cinematography. I'd photographed him and his, uh, Losey and his family. 
and he asked me to shoot this film. I was a uh, relatively inexperienced, probably aged 29, with naturalistic films behind me and no big studio action film. And Losey was probably a little bit lost himself, if I can say so. He was a, a fine director, an important director, and a really good man. Um, but the film ran into schedule problems. It, f it started to go too slowly for the schedule. And studio, American studios need to put, point a finger when things uh, go wrong. And it's usually the cinematographer who, who gets it, f uh, the, the gun first. So I was released from that film. So I can't really talk. I'm talking very honestly about the film, but I can't tell you about much of the film. I did some day for night work and I did some helicopter from the ground work. I, I remember looking at locations with Losey in, in a helicopter and the helicopter pilot playing tricks on us and trying to frighten us. And that's one of the things that made me decide never to, to do aerial photography again. He was an probably in his mid-sixties. I was in my late twenties. I was not mature enough for the film. And one day in the mountains, I made a joke, uh, ill-considered joke to, to Robert Shaw, who was a very macho actor, good actor. And he was also a novelist of some talent, I believe. But he didn't appreciate the joke. He felt it somehow reflected on his masculinity. And I think that's why I was fired from the film, not because we were just behind schedule, but because mm -hmm. Robert Shaw didn't want to work with me. Right. <laughs> well, um, so we'll move on <laughs> to... Uh, um, no, well, many years later I met Losey in, in a restaurant by chance in Paris, and he said, right. you know the part of the film that you photographed was probably the best. Really? <laughs> yes. Well, there is a sequence actually which I remember from the film, and it reminded me of some of your earlier work where... Yes. I think they're looking at the helicopter from the ground. Yeah. The sun is behind the helicopter and it shines through. The helicopter is um, in silhouette. I remember that from some of your earlier films. Like yes, it may be films. something I did. Yes. I can't honestly know, remember whether I was involved at that point. Yeah. Uh, a, a very good uh, French cinematographer to go over. Ah, Alcan, probably. Mm. Henri, Henri Alcan. Yeah. And there was somebody um, brought in to do the aerial photography especially I think wasn't there on that film Pro oh, in probably yeah I think so well yes might have been later on I guess in it needs aerial photography d does yeah. need a specialist yes yeah, yeah. Um, so your next film uh, Melody yes um, which I believe was with uh, well, Warris Hussain, Hussain again, again yes yes, yes. Um, again a lot of uh, location but this time a contemporary film in around London what was, uh, what was I haven't that? got anything special to say about no. that um, except I've never been able to work out why it was so popular in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> Often, when I worked with Japanese people, uh, or the few times I did, they would cite Melody as one of their, mm. Merody, as one of their favorite films. Yeah, and no, I've read that uh, Mark Lester was often um, brought in over there for special events. And Is that right? Yeah, yeah. television interviews and things, <laughs> yeah. It's yes. It's uh, long since been forgotten over here. I don't I really want to talk about that film. Not no. that I had a bad experience on no. it, but I don't have anything There's interesting to say about it. Um, okay, so we go back to period films with The Pied Piper. Um, yes. Your next production. Yes, that um, was probably the next time after John Borman that I worked with a, a director with a sense of, of vision of any, any kind. Mm. Too many films seem to happen uh, in that period seem to happen by, by accident. Right. No, not by design, <laughs> but uh, John Borman, uh, with John Borman everything, everything happened for better or worse by design and uh, with Jacques Demy as well. He is one of the few directors I'd, I had worked with up to that point, well perhaps the only one apart from John Borman, who wanted to decide, to decide entirely on his own where, where to put the camera wh um, and how to, he wanted to move it a lot, he wanted mm -hmm. to do a lot of tracking shots. And you'd walk around the set with a, a finder all the time. Yes. Um, and that was that was shot in Germany, I believe. The, the major part of it major. was shot in Germany. There were some studio interiors mm. in a t small studio owned by the Lee brothers in London, but most of it was made in in Germany in mm -hmm. in Oldenburg. Yes. Um, just thinking about the 
the location work and the studio work. What is done to, to kind of match up the two? Obviously, I'm guessing the filming is some time apart. I don't know which way around it was for this film, if it was the interiors first or the uh, location. But what do you do, what, what in your minds do you have to do to kind of match up those two? Is there? Well, uh, often it's a question of light. Uh, it's desirable probably for, for questions of believability that the light that you have on the exterior should be reflected, should match the interior light. Very often you'll see uh, in a film a, an exterior shot in overcast light and suddenly on the interior the sun is shining through the window. Mm -hmm. It looks good M and maybe the audience is never disturbed. It always disturbed me to do, to do that. In this case the, the exteriors were filmed in, in Germany and the interiors were a dark castle scene, so it didn't it, matching wasn't a, uh, a problem. The mat the the atmosphere had to come from a con uh, continuation of uh, the aesthetics of the film, the the design, and the clothes. Yes. Uh, and it, we had a wonderful designer and uh, wardrobe uh, designer as well. To my mind, the. I think the f if the film suffers from anything, it's because Jack's English wasn't really fluent and he didn't understand when he wasn't getting good performances. Mm. <laughs> but it was a superb experience. He, he's a, he was a lovely person and an interesting, mm -hmm. interesting director with a point of view. Some great actors again, I believe. John Hurt and Donald Pleasance. Yes, yeah. Some of the roles had really good actors in them, and, and the minor roles often didn't. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, obviously, a period film, but a fairy tale as well. Was was there anything um, a different approach from yourself for that film? No, I don't think no. so. To be honest, no. I I didn't say to myself, I'm going to put on a fairy cloak, and no. <laughs> no. Um, so moving on, Henry VIII and his six wives, yes. um, mainly interiors for this film. Yes. Um, coming off the back of the Pied Piper, was that quite an easy um, transition? Yes, um, yes, uh, yeah. I didn't, I don't recall any particular uh, problems and the film is somewhat stiff and yeah. So no, I won't say any more about it. But, no. uh, I, I've learnt on every single day and on every single film I've worked on, so I'm, I'm sure I learnt a lot on that film. Mm. But it's it's not one of my best films. No. Um, well, going from the two uh, period films, then we have uh, that'll be the day and all creatures great and small. Yes. Very naturalistic looking films, yes. even though periods, um, relatively recent period films at the time. Yeah. Um, a number of shots, including um, as the beach scenes uh, with David Essex on that will be the day, the fairground scenes, all very natural lighting. Yes. For that. Was that very minimal um, lighting? I suppose it was, and I suppose it was part of my my aesthetic in those days. I've I've changed enormously, and I much prefer more expressive work today than naturalistic work. But I think it was probably the right choice for the f for the film anyway, mm. to to make it look uh, real mm -hmm. and I, sp I, I guess I have to recognize that everything in British cinema surrounding me at that time everything I liked was in the same manner shot in the same manner naturalistically mm -hmm. most mostly not everything there were, were some wonderful exceptions uh, like um, now I'm struggling to remember the title of the name of the director, Jack Clayton. Mm. It was not naturalistic, but um, one of the m uh, unrecognized greats of that period. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, certainly moving from the 60s, where we had quite bold color designs in a lot of the films. Was that, as you say, that kind of a, a tendency for British cinema at that point, kind of moving away from those strong color designs of the 1960s? I'm trying to remember whether there were some uh, stylistically interesting films of the 70s uh, shot during the 70s, but I think it was a general tendency to mm. shoot to, to be naturalistic. Mm. 
Goodness. Um, are there any memories of working on all creatures, great and small, in uh, North Yorkshire? Sort of. Yes. Back in the north yes. again. Yes. Yes. Uh, wha wha one of the memories <laughs> that stayed with me ever since then was uh, being asked to shoot the the birth of a, a foal. Uh, the problem was uh, pointed out straight away before before embarking on it was that we were shooting during the day and the birth was likely to be at night and mm -hmm. I uh, I couldn't un see how they could imagine that I would do both, so I asked my father if, if he would uh, shoot it for me. I prepared the, the the light in the stall where the foal was due to be born, and in fact I spent one night, the first night expecting to shoot it. Uh, and sleeping in a in a caravan with the director and his girlfriend, in in a sleeping uh, in separate bunks, with a with a heater on in in the caravan, and uh, near, I think we nearly suffocated from from the fumes emitted by the heater. These are things I remember, and I remember working with a, a young Anthony Hopkins, whom I'd never heard of at that time, mm. and Simon Ward. I remember the actors. I remember it very fondly. Yes. Yeah. Not a great film, but I remember I have fond memories of shooting it. Mm. Yes. Again, as a TV director, and I don't say this with with dis disdain, especially today, as some of the, the very best work being done isn't uh, 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 on TV. Mm -hmm. But then perhaps that wasn't the case. It, it does have the look of a TV movie yeah. um, from that period, actually. Yes. Um, yes. Was that was there anything? Um, to re recreate that period, that 30s period, I mean, a lot of uh, costumes. Well, just the props and the cars, yeah, yes. Yeah. I, I do remember, that pat particularly, that uh, one, one memory comes back to me of Claude Watham, with whom I worked twice. Uh, being, uh, a, being of the TV culture and ha therefore having to be very prepared and th thought out, instead of being a director who would come on set with not completely formed ideas and exp uh, being ready to explore the possibilities, uh, looking at a rehearsal and uh, discussing how we we're going to shoot the film. He, uh, like Warris was saying, would draw diagrams the night, the day before, mm. at perhaps earlier, um, about where to put the camera. And sometimes I can remember one or two occasions when he, his uh, idea of how to shoot the scene seemed to be completely wrong to me. He's, he would say, I want to shoot the, f the scene in the corner of this room. And the camera, as I could see it, would be facing the corner. We'd have an interesting room to shoot in, which we would never see. And if I suggested that it, it might be more interesting to put the actors in a different place with the room behind them, um, I remember he felt that as, as a sort of attack on his mm. concept, it was difficult to to to, uh, to discuss it with him. Rather, it, I didn't want to have a have a fight over it at all. But it seemed to be to be wrong to be mm. shooting in a corner when we had so much more that we could show. Mm. Those are, those are my <laughs> memories of that film. Yes. <laughs> um, so we'll move on then to your next film, um, Rocky Horror Picture Show, I believe. Yes. Um, so a number of the um, the crew were brought over from the original stage production. What was that that like working with the the crew who put together the original the crew, shows? I don't know. That I remember the production designer was definitely the yeah. production designer who had designed the sh the show and of course the cast. Mm. But uh, who else would have been? Oh, well, Jim Jim Sharman involved with the film. Oh yes, but he was the director. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. So I mean, was there a, a collaboration between how the very film much, should very look? much, yes, yeah. very much. No, it was a, it was a, both difficult and great fun. It was difficult because we had too little time, or very little time. We had six weeks mm -hmm. to shoot the film in the music for a musical. That's pretty short. Uh, and but but the cast all knew their their lines uh, and the songs, so that speeded things up. But I, um, yeah, I think it was the first time that I had a, a really stylized film to shoot. Mm -hmm. um, I was much more anxious about my craft in those days than I than I am today. So it was under pressure and stress that we that w I was working. But at the same time, 
I, I had the sense that this was something unusual. I, it wasn't part of my world at all. I went to see the, to see the stage show, and the, the style of music is very far removed from the music I love. But I, at the same time, I could see the, the humor and, in it. I had no idea that it uh, would age so well or become such a cult film. When I see it today, it, compared to everything else that I shot at, had shot previously, it doesn't seem to have an age to it, whereas most of the films I've worked on are very dated. Mm -hmm. uh, this one I, I don't think will date for a long time because it has no particular, yeah. it has such an, uh, uh, its own particular world, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is not tied to the time in which it was made. The only reference it makes all the time are to horror films. Mm -hmm. So what was that like then? Um, because you were filming down at Bray, I believe, um, and not being a big fan of horror, um, what was that like? Did you did you draw inspiration from Hammer? I mean, I know it was a parody. No, I I'd, I'd, I'd never s I've never seen horror films, so no. I'd, or virtually not. No. So I, I wasn't thinking of them. No. I was just treating it as a strange, quirky film to be. Uh, all, uh, whose characters should be emphasised somehow in the in the in the photography. Mm -hmm. the, st the studio was a small studio and it had practical problems. It, it only had one stage, it had a tiny annex stage, I think. But that meant that when we had finished shooting one particular scene, say the lab scene, we had to leave the studio whilst and give them time to pull it, pull the set down and build the next one. So that's why we had to go into the house next door, which Hammer used. Mm. Um, and there's an interesting sequence at the start, the, the wedding ceremony yes. at the start of the film, that has a, um, a 50s B-movie yes. look to it. Well, part of the problem uh, of that, uh, which I should, should uh, relate to you, is related to the slow speed of the stock yes. that we were using. Mm -hmm. If it was, I, th I seem to recall it was 64 ASA for daylight. So you had to put a filter on, an orange filter in front of the camera for shooting daylight scenes because it was a tungsten balanced stock. And as we were shooting on a bad day, a dark day, I had to use lights to get an exposure to, to make the actors look okay. So that gives it, that, that practical reason gives it that beef movie <laughs> feeling. <laughs> Not because I really liked it. Oh, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> um. And you mentioned that being, you know, one of your first real stylized film, you, you kind of move from scene to scene, and each one has a, an individual look. Uh, you know, we get to the lab and then to the floor show at the end of the film. Um, so was this the first time when you had that sort of uh, almost like a theatrical piece? And we do that again with uh, Lissomania mm. with um, Russell. Is this kind of where you learned that, that technique, sort of having individual shots that were very, very different? That's uh, tough to give you an easy, easy answer. I, I've always, uh, yes, perhaps I, uh, perhaps I allowed myself to change style uh, from, from uh, scene to scene. Mm. Today I would tend to feel that the film should have a unified feeling to it, but there are occasions when you need to change the look. Mm -hmm. uh, and with, Ken Russell, with Ken Russell, everything was, was permitted, really. Mm -hmm. Um, is there anything about, with it being such an iconic film, is there anything else you remember about um, Rocky Horror in terms of uh, your approach to the film? Or perhaps any memories of uh, working with the crew and bringing that, that, that look to the screen? Well, yeah, I can remember one particular scene, sequence. Uh, near, near the end of the film, they've got the RKO symbol in the background. And I suggested that there was a, an easy way to make the lightning flashes work. The RKO um, trailer uh, symbol was this tower, radio tower mast with, with lightning flashes. So how to do that on, on the, uh, the set of the film? But I, ca I came up with a, with a solution which I think was effective and, and simple. I'd I don't remember how and when, but I'd, I'd become familiar with uh, front projection material. I don't recall the, the name of it anymore, but it's very similar to what 
the treatment given to road signs so that when you're sitting in your car and your headlight touches the, the road sign, it sh shines back uh, at you very brightly. So th this material, this front projection material, um, had a characteristic that uh, allowed, the p really encouraged light to come back towards the camera if the light shining on it was from very close or even through the lens. It was designed for it to go through the, the light to go through the lens of the projector. Mm -hmm. But in, anyway, that said and done, I won't enter into that. I, I suggested that if they cut out the lightning symbols, or the lightning flashes out of the front projection material, stick it on onto the set, I, I would then have a small, very small and weak lamp nec right next to the lens and flash it on and off, and this would produce the lightning flashes. Mm -hmm. And that's how that's how we did it. Yes. Um, but I had fun. I had fun with that scene and with with the stylized nature of the film mm. altogether. And, uh, that went on to influence your work with Russell. I'm guessing, probably did. Kind of it probably um, did. Working yes. in uh, the studio sets. Um, so the first of two films uh, with Ken Russell is Somania. Um, did you approach again? Did you approach the different periods in? Uh, Lister's life um, with different techniques. No. Almost no. No, I didn't. No, no. I didn't. Um, so at the end of the film, we have the, the point um, in Wagner's castle, which kind of echoes uh, the Rocky Horror sort of horror style. Mm. Um, was there any sort of uh, similarities in how you worked on that scene? It's, it's kind of again, it's got that horror style. It might have reminded me of it. It yeah. was actually, I think, the first scene that we filmed mm. uh, in the schedule of the film and very maybe on the first day of filming something went wrong which altered the the planning of the whole film because the actor playing uh, Wagner was suspended on wires mm -hmm. and in those days the te that technique hadn't been used a lot we had people from the circus to, to uh, fly it, make him fly. And somehow their apparatus went wrong and the cable broke and he fell to the ground and broke his leg on the first day. So <laughs> there was a quick res rescheduling whilst uh, the actor's leg repaired over a two month period, I should think. Mm -hmm. um, but the, yeah, the set probably reminded me of the, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm -hmm. the, the great thing about working on those two films was that Ken Russell's main interest was in the look of the film mm -hmm. and so a, a good proportion of the production money was spent on production design mm -hmm. and we always had interesting sets. Script was a second I think for him, not <laughs> <laughs> but it was wonderful for a young DOP like myself because I was presented with many difficult things to do mm -hmm. and large sets which I'd never had the, the luck to work on before mm -hmm. and he had a good eye. Yes, because um, I believe Ken Russell, he liked to look through the camera quite often. He, um, yes, I think he that he did, but yeah. that was at the moment when video was being, video assist was developed. Mm -hmm. And m possibly on Lister Mania we didn't have it, but certainly by the time, well, I think we did, I think we did, and certainly by the time that we did Valentino, it was mm -hmm. um, used by, on all films. Mm -hmm. And Russell spent a long time looking at his video and talking with the camera operator about headroom. That was <laughs> became his main <laughs> obsession. Was there enough? Was there too little? Because mm. <laughs> he was very specific, wasn't he, Ken Russell, with um, movements in the camera? I think he... Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, the visuals were, were, were his main interest, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it was very fortunate for me. Mm. Um, you've mentioned in the past that you used a lot of uh, coloured gels on this film. I probably did. Mm -hmm. I can't remember mm -hmm. talking about it in the past, but I probably did for the first time, yes. yes. Um, and obviously that added to the effect that uh, Ken probably wanted. On yes. The film. And there's an interesting sequence at the start um, uh, where Liss is in bed. Um, there's a bedroom sequence with billowing curtains, mm. and very blue sort of light to the, uh, the scene. Um, it was very well lit as well. I, do you remember how much about that sequence? It's a very, very strong scene. He's in bed, you say? Yes, it's, it's the beginning of the film. Hmm. It's, it's, um, I think it's um, uh, Liszt and Marie, I think, at the start of the film. 
This is the one where she goes onto a swing. Uh, I think it might be, yeah, yes. Well, the, I quickly understood that everything was uh, going to be extravagant and mm -hmm. I might as well be ex extravagant myself. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of, lot of fun with that because I'd never been encouraged to go into th in that direction. Mm. Um, and this is the first film where you, there's the sequence, um, the Charlie Chaplin sequence uh, in black and white. Um, was this one of the, the, the films where you were using colour stock and changing um, the, the film to black and white in post-production? Yes, we did, we did some uh, experimentation before the film mm. and Russell uh, asked me if we, if, we, if we could try using a silent camera, a hand crank camera. I knew a little bit about hand crank cameras because in my film school in Paris, I had a very elderly teacher who had started in 1905 and he had given me some instructions on using hand crank cameras and how mm. to do fades and dissolves in the camera, all of which I thought at the time was useless information, but now it's the most precious memory I have of that time at film school. Uh, so we did try putting film through a hand crank camera and we looked at the, the black and white results and we compared it to converting mm -hmm. a colour to black and white and we opted for the latter. Mm. It just looked better, yes. quite honestly. Was that, were you quite fond of shooting that sequence? Was that the, uh, the film studio scene, you mean? Um, I don't remember the Charlie the Chaplin. It was um, Roger Daltrey uh, dressed as Charlie Chaplin, I believe. And it's the, the black and white um, yeah. silence. Uh -huh. That's faded and faded from my memory. I, I can't remember the scene anymore. Mm. No. But um, but you use similar techniques again for Valentino, I believe, uh, for shooting, um, recreating yes. the silent films. Yes. Um, was that a similar process that you used for Valentino, a shooting in colour then yes. converting? Yes, certainly, yes. yeah. And I n knew a little bit about f uh, some of the equipment used in film studios uh, in the silent days because I was very interested in silent film. So I had mm. a lot of fun with that. And would that just been a matter of just removing all of the colour uh, from the film in uh, post-production? Yes, I guess. yes. Yeah. Um, so the, the film, parts of the film which were filmed on what would be recreations of the, the original sets, um, do you employ any silent era lighting techniques or was there a, a kind of a look or? To be honest, no, I don't think I no. did. I just no. came up with what I sh thought would look most interesting rather than trying to be faithful. I think the, f the important, I still think the important part of a period film is, is to make the, the costumes and the, uh, the sets look believable mm -hmm. and the hair too. Yes. Uh, oh gosh, the other day I saw film in which the period was totally betrayed by one of the male actors' hair. So often uh, an actor who's brought on to a film for only a few days doesn't want to have his hair cut. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're talking about, I'm talking about a, a film that was supposed to take place during the war. Yeah. So one of, one of the actors had long hair, which was unthinkable in those mm. days. I think I recall an interview with um, uh, costume designer Jocelyn Rickard said the same thing uh, working in the 60s that because a number of the actresses wouldn't have their hair changed mm. that gave the game away everything else could be fine and it was the haircuts that always got them yes well I think so that's oh, oh, the, the, the director has to stipulate before the, ca the casting is decided has to tell the actress that she's going to have to damn well have her hair in period mm -hmm. otherwise you don't get the role yeah. um, For um, Valentino, do you remember if there was there any post-production uh, techniques used? Um, I don't remember any. No, no, I don't remember no. any. Mm. Well, things were not as flexible then as they are mm. now. We couldn't really do very much to the to the to the film. Mm. Um, there was a sequence um, which I believe was shot at. Um, the ballroom in Blackpool. Yes. A uh, big open space, the boxing sequence, yes. I believe. Um, do you have any memories about lighting uh, 
uh, that particular sequence. Oh, I just remember enjoying every location we filmed in because uh, Russell had a very good art sense, aesthetic, mm -hmm. visual, uh, visually sensitive sense. And we always had great locations to shoot in. This was an ornate, ornate ballroom of, in of large size, requiring lots of uh, pre-lighting and so I would have had I would have had uh, great fun with that, but I don't. I can't tell you anything specifically uh, specific or very interesting about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we could stop there. Perhaps. After Valentino, we move on to uh, the Empire Strikes Back and uh, Crawl. Um, so working in the fantasy genre and obviously doing a lot of. Um, um, interior work, studio work, and also with the faster um, film stocks uh, during this period. Um, how did you adapt to working in the sort of the fancy genre with uh, a lot of special effects techniques during this period? Well, I have to give you a, a rambling answer, I think. I had seen the big science fiction film of the time, 2001, and was thrilled to be taken on, on that journey into, an, into an, another world. So when I was approached about Star Wars, the first one, uh, I was, um, I read the script. I, I didn't know George Lucas's work. I hadn't seen, what's it called, two, TFX? Is THX. that the name? Sorry? Oh, uh, THX 1138? Yes, I had not seen that film. But I went for the meeting. And I, I had read the script, and I said to, to George Lucas, uh, thank you very much for bringing me in for this interview, but I don't have an, any experience of visual effects. You really ought to have um, the gentleman who shot 2001, and he's a very good cinematographer. Yes, he said, well, you're probably right, but he's not available. <laughs> and he had seen some of my work, and he liked it. But in the end, the film studio, 20th Century Fox, agreed with my assessment that I was not the right person for the job. And they chose a, a, a great cinematographer who'd uh, worked with Kubrick on, uh, on um, Dr. Strangelove and Polanski on uh, two, two films. But they didn't uh, see eye to eye. They didn't get on at all well during the filming. Uh, he accused the the director and, and the producers of being a bunch of amateurs. And he said the film would never be a success. <laughs> Boy, was he wrong. <laughs> and they came back to me for the next film and I said, I still don't have the special effects um, experience. And uh, the answer this time was, it doesn't matter. You come to San Francisco for a few days and, you, and we'll take you around. Uh, you'll meet all, all the, the, the uh, technicians and we'll talk about everything that we might be doing. So that's how I became involved in it. And yes, I, I, I've always loved being taken on a, a journey out of, out of my world, whether it's into today's world, but a completely different experience or another planet. It doesn't matter as long as I'm taken on a journey that enthralls me, I don't mind. Uh, and this being uh, not related to our world gave me, uh, I felt, a lot of freedom to, to find to enter a fantasy world. And when it came to the, the last scene in the film that we were going to shoot, which was the fight on the ramp, um, the production designer said to me, we've run out of money. We don't have, I don't have money to build a set. I, I can build a ramp and a bit of pipe work in the foreground. And I said, well, I understand. Don't worry. I think I can do the rest with light and some smoke and steam. And I was just... Uh, able to, to use my imagination a bit and uh, come up with a solution to the problem. So I've, in, I've enjoyed creating different worlds. I, I still mostly, uh, not mostly, I still really hanker after uh, seeing a film that uh, has a meaningful situation in it. And of course there's something childlike and boy's own like about Star Wars. It's not my favorite genre, but I'm so glad I worked on it at the same time. Mm. And then, uh, yes, I, was, uh, I went on to work 
because you're quickly characterized, uh, quickly pigeonholed, I was asked to shoot a number of science fiction films, and as it's not my favorite genre, unless the script is really transporting and, and marvelous, I'm not especially drawn to science fiction. However, I have worked on several science fiction films subsequently, and um, Kral was uh, an attempt to blend genres, not totally successful, I don't think, but it wanted to blend sword and sorcery, which was popular at the time, and science fiction. Mm -hmm. And visually, it gave me uh, many opportunities. Yes, and um, working with the uh, special effects team, was there anything, um, any different approach to the film? Uh, you had to take in terms of your well, work? Th the thing that uh, made me anxious about prior to shooting The Empire Strikes Back was the use of ex uh, technical expressions with which I was not familiar, describing processes which I knew nothing about, like front projection, back projection, map photography, etc. And I quickly learned that they, though they were not complex. You had to use your eyes and your best uh, visual judgment mm -hmm. in carrying out the, the pr using the processes, and there would always be a uh, post-production e uh, technician on hand to exchange ideas with and to, to ask who would in say, sometimes ask me to do uh, something with the lighting or I would, I would suggest something and he, he would say, yes, that, that'll work well for me. But in, in the end, the processes were quite simple. Some of them ma were magical. The most magical one I uh, encountered was front projection, mm -hmm. that's something that's not used anymore at all. But that was a process which, uh, with which you could blend, instead of using rear projection, with projecting a, an already shot scene in the for the background and then having the actor in the foreground, and usually it looked fake, um, you could uh, do it all in the camera, and th the person looking through the camera was the only person who could see what it looked like mm -hmm. because it was so directional. Uh, it used it used front projection material, which we talked about earlier on, which sent back to the camera uh, an image, and if you moved off angle from the camera, you couldn't see that image anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I learnt a lot about a few a few processes, some of which aren't used anymore. Yeah. And am I right in saying, did you use one of the VistaVision cameras? For we did, yes. yes. We used a VistaVision camera for, because it gave a larger ne negative, mm -hmm. more uh, detail for the post-production people to use, so that their scenes such as this uh, cockpit scenes in, in their fighter planes a shot, this division, I think. Uh, a few shots here and there throughout the film wh where we, we, we used this division for. Unfortunately, we didn't have a means of seeing our rushes, and this had a, an inconvenience uh, to it because a few months later, George Lucas not very uh, hadn't, and he hadn't promptly seen our rushes. They were all sent to him, but he didn't screen them. He said, one of your lenses, the 28 millimeter, is not properly calibrated and the shots are not sharp. We can't use them, but it was far too late to reshoot mm -hmm. them. But it was a clever, a very clever process. I don't know if you want me to go into it at all. Yes, please, yeah. Let's okay. Well, in 1952 or three, um, somebody went to 20th Century Fox with the idea of shooting of creating anamorphic lenses. And they said, great idea, because I presume the, the conversation was about TV and how much TV was robbing the audience from cinema. Well, how wonderful they can produce a spectacular wide screen and tempt the audiences back from the TV out into the cinema again. It was copyrighted, um, patented, and nobody else was allowed to to make an anamorphic lens for, I don't know how many years, but a few years. So various uh, comp uh, ideas uh, were, were brought forth. The most regrettable idea was widescreen, because uh, 
Earth. That was just a cheap, a cheap version of Cinemascope in which we lost two th uh, a thir probably a third of the negative. Mm -hmm. So it led to a uh, slight de degrading of the image and, and a loss of the beautiful ac academy ratio. That was all down to, I, I believe, I believe that that was bec the root cause of that was, bec was Cinemascope and the inability of anybody else to, to, uh, to make a similar process. Somebody else said, uh, came up with uh, Cinerama, which didn't go anywhere because it was three, three cameras, three projectors, and with each screen, each projector pr producing weave and wobble, it was quite a strain to watch for more than a few minutes. So we're, we're stuck with widescreen ever since then, or Cinemascope. Mm. Am I losing track of where? Oh yes, VistaVision. Yeah. VistaVision was an, uh, a genius idea. The, ca the film will run sideways, as it does in a, a still camera, and you will end up with a, a bigger negative, and you can use spherical lenses, which are inherently better than anamorphic lenses. The only problem was that um, it required theatres to re-equip and only uh, probably one theatre in London re-equipped and one in New York, etc. Mm -hmm. So it never caught on. Mm. But it, it remained a useful tool for visual effects. Yes. Um, so talking specifically about um, Krull, um, I believe at first, the film was going to be all shots on location. Then it was decided that it would be shots in the studio. Is that right? I don't recall that no. pr uh, debate. It's very possible that that's correct. I wouldn't yes. contradict that. No, no. I um, don't think Peter Yates had, he had shot an entirely studio film. He'd worked in the United States, in Hollywood, very successfully with, with Bullet. But that was a mixture of studio and mm. location. Mm. And so... Kral became a mixture of studio mm. and, and location. And you'd taken over quite a lot of the uh, stages at Pinewood, I believe, for Probably, uh, yes. that was quite a big, yes. big production. Yeah, it was a big production, yes. Um, uh, was, th was there anything, um, I remember there's, there's quite an extended uh, swamp sequence, which is quite reminiscent of some of the scenes from um, Empire Strikes Back. Swamp sequence, yes. Uh, yes, 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 yes. You, you used the James Bond's uh, yes. stage for that. That's right. Yes. Um, so was there some of the experiences coming over from working on the Star Wars film. Uh, well, I'd easy. learnt on a lot yes. on doing The Empire Strikes Back and I mm. continue to learn until yesterday. <laughs> so yeah, Brilliant. but it was a very big set indeed, yeah. bigger than the swamp set in The uh, um, Empire Strikes Back. Mm. Mm. And I decided to put two sons into it. Yes. I thought uh, I had the freedom to, since we're in a different world, to, yeah. to allow myself to have two sons. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so this was the period in which the, the the faster film stocks came into play. I guess that gave you more freedom in the Probably, studio. Probably yes, yeah. but I think I was forever struggling to to make it look as good as the, uh, the slower stock and not succeeding. Mm. So you had the faster speed, but the the quality just wasn't the same. It wasn't the yeah. same, especially mm. when it became duped. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um, so talking a little bit about um, film stocks, um, part of our project we're interested in um, the discussion of Eastman colour fading, um, mm. which became noticeable in the late 70s. It was being discussed um, most prominently by Martin Scorsese. Um, How has that impacted on your own work? And well, uh, it's just reinforced my feelings. Uh, the fact that the colours fa have faded has reinforced my feelings that we should be shooting digitally. Mm -hmm. um, in that process, the files can disappear completely and you can be left with no movie. But in theory, the, the quality shouldn't shift. Yeah. It, I found it really upsetting to see uh, a movie that I've shot projected in, 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 in the cinema and my, uh, only being able to see magenta mm -hmm. on the screen. It's very, very depressing for me. And has that impacted on any of your work? Have you? Um, I don't think about any of your films being at risk. Um, well, I'm sure they were, they're all at risk, yeah. really. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing. I c I can, I'm not even asked to, very, very often I'm not asked to be part of the process of transferring a film to DVD or Blu-ray. Mm. 
I wasn't even asked about the Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. So they increased the contrast enormously, I think. Mm. Um, and I think that is, that's been part of the problem, the fact that um, certain personnel working on the films aren't consulted um, when future restorations and no. digitization projects happen. Um, and you, m you mentioned this with Empire Strikes Back, but we have certain generations, particularly with videotape, DVD, um, and Blu-ray now, that the look of the film is changing. And ap apart from Empire Strikes Back, have you have you ever seen a, a screening of any of your films, or have you seen them on television or on VHS? Yes, I, I, I saw a screening about two years ago, which film I can't... I think it might have been a Ken, Ken Russell film. I cannot remember anymore which one it was, but it was horrible to see. Hmm. In terms of how it looks on the screen? Yes, yes. because the, it, the colours have ch shifted. Mm. And all, all that was left was magenta. Mm. Yes, I think the problem is people's memories of these films change over time, depending on where they're being exhibited, whether it be on television. Well, that's or true, but that's true of silent films. People think silent films look scratched and degraded, mm. but they look superb. If you can see mm. something struck from an original negative, it looks yeah. wonderful. Um, sort of talking about your films more generally, in terms of the show prints, those original prints that were made. Um, you've mentioned the imbibition process where the, um, the film did look slightly different. As the imbibition process ended and we moved into the 70s and 80s. I think it was probably in existence until the mid 70s. I think yes it was uh, before it was closed. Um, did that improve at all going into sort of the late 70s and 80s? When well yes I think it did. Yes. I think that it did when, when they started when everybody started printing on Eastman Colour, yes. Mm. I, perhaps the imbibition process prints uh, have not faded. I don't know, I haven't seen one. The prints themselves, no, they, um, but they were printed of how it's, on how it's printed. That's right, if they were printed yeah. on Eastman Colour, they would have faded, yeah. yes. 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 Um, and I know specifically it's from certain periods within the, the Eastman Colour history that yes. they're more prone to fading. Yes. And there were a number of... Um, since it was kind of uh, brought to the, the attention of the I world in the late 70s, there were things done. I to think all, all prints have faded. Mm. But if, uh, of course, if Technicolor films uh, are, are protected because they're, they're made with a separation yes, uh, of course. Three, of three primary colors. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way, they say, to preserve any film is to, mm. to uh, make negatives mm. uh, with a separation process. But it's yes. expensive. Oh, it is. And I know that even for Eastman colour films, uh, black and white separations yes, could have been protection. Yes, that's what I mean. Yes. yes. Uh, were you aware? Did you...? No, I didn't know that then. No, no. But I think no production would have uh, thought forwards so many years. And People it was expensive to do as well. So. Yes, but relatively, relatively inexpensive, mm. as far as I know. It's probably talking somewhere between 30 and 50,000 pounds. Mm. But when you think of the resale value, to TV of older films, that's mm. probably not so much, but mm. money. But uh, people didn't think of in those terms. They didn't think of the value of their their library mm. in those days. Yes, it was usually the the first print room and uh, yes. exhibition, and that yes. was kind of yes. that was it then, wasn't that's it? it? Yes. Um, so, sort of moving on and talking more generally about your career, uh, are there any experiences in outside of the feature film industry? Uh, where perhaps you may have used um, other processes or have there been any experiences working on uh, in advertising or with mm. sponsored films that might be of interest to us for the projects? Uh, short answers, I don't think so. No. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think I, entered, I embarked on exper technical exper experiments in commercials. There's never the time to try anything in a commercial. Mm. You're supposed to, you're expected to produce on the day. Mm -hmm. There's no money set aside for testing anything. Mm -hmm. Even if, even if I was doing it unpaid, it would still cost something. Mm -hmm. That's just not done. But there must be some cinematographers and some directors who have had the for good fortune to be able to test something out mm -hmm. and try something unusual. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's my I don't think that's my case on commercials, although I shot a, a lot 
during my time, I've shot a lot of commercials. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't recall any, any in which I've had um, a period of exper experimentation beforehand. Uh, working in advertising and sponsored films, how much were the, uh, the company who were funding the films, how much input did they have? Because you're obviously doing a job for them. Was there ever people on set who were trying to create a certain look? Or you, were you entrusted uh, just as you would be? It's such a different world to working on movies. Unfortunately, in, uh, well, there are big pluses to working in commercials. You, you get a chance to, to try things out even if you don't have a pre-production period. You, you can be bold and you can learn a lot. And it keeps your eye in training. Uh, etc. But the the poor director has to please so many people. You sh normally on a film, the director, once the casting is agreed with the producers uh, and the script is finalised, the, the director can please him or herself mm -hmm. unless something goes wrong with the, the schedule and they f fall badly behind, which um, has a financial impact that you can begin only begin to imagine. There, Usually an, a director is at that stage is able to just please him or herself. But on a commercial, the director has to please agency people. Uh, sometimes there are multiple agencies involved. And uh, they also have to defer to the cl so-called client, who's never really the client. He's always also an employee, but he, seems, he or she seems to have immense power. Mm -hmm. So the experience is, quite, is really quite different yes. and can be very frustrating for the director. Um, I guess I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the transitional period between uh, shooting on film mm. and digital. Yes. And if you could just tell me a little bit about uh, the benefits. Well, well, I can only talk about my experience yeah. and my observation bef until I, 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 the first time I used a, a digital camera it was the Alexa. In, and uh, in my case, it was on a film called Cosmopolis with David Cronenberg. We'd talked about digital cameras prior to that because they had been in existence for perhaps five years mm -hmm. before that, a very short period of time. You see, uh, film cameras didn't shift very much. They, they didn't change. The movement stayed the same for generations. And the lenses didn't change very much. Nothing changed. Every, every 20 years, a new camera would come out. That's, I'm talking about film camera. So he and I had talked about uh, digital photography for f three, four, five years before we actually embarked on it and used it. And he, he's, a very, he, he's very interested in technology and all, th all things scientific, probably more than I am. And we both felt that what we had seen so far didn't inspire us, it wasn't good enough. And finally, we saw films shot on the Alexa, and we thought, yes, that I encouraged him to, to shift into digital photography. And I have to say that uh, after half an hour on the first day of filming, I said to myself, well, I actually never want to go back to film again. Mm -hmm. This is for me. I can see exactly what we're going to get on a high-definition screen. There are no, sec no secrets, no mystery. The only downside is that the viewfinder is not very good. At that stage, it certainly wasn't. And the viewfinder was also always part of my body. The, mm -hmm. the camera felt like part of my body, and I lit through the camera, and I was no longer able to do that. Mm -hmm. That was the, the new thing I had to get used to. Our power and mystery was diminished because on film we were the, the director of photography who was the only person who knew what it would look like, more or less, mm -hmm. the next day when we saw the film, Rushes. Uh, now everybody can see it, and there's a chance for uh, for people to to give their opinions if they want to. I've never had a problem with that myself, but I, I'm, I'm sure some people do have that mm. problem mm. quite frequently. But the, the upside is that uh, the camera is very sensitive. The You can shoot with in low light situations. You can shoot at the end of the day or the beginning of the day with no problem. And the only problem that some people may see is that there's too much information recorded mm -hmm. and you might m might feel inclined, the director of photography might feel inclined to do something about that. 
in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a similarity in the look of films because there's not so much choice. You, we, we ended up uh, later on in, color, color in co the color years with being able to choose between several stocks, which wasn't the case when I was starting to use color. But now there are not so many um, sensors mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. and they, they tend to look similar. That's the only danger, perhaps. Um, just to go back to something you just said there, um, later in your career, did you, did you ever work with Fuji or anything, or did you stick with Eastman Colour? No, I did work several times with Fuji, mm. or once or twice with David Cronenberg, and certainly in France, on one or two films. Yeah. I liked having the opportunity to choose between different stocks which had different characteristics. Mm -hmm. And um, were, were there particular benefits from working with uh, the Fuji film over? It look, probably looked a bit gentler, yeah. but um, the, the aim of Fuji was to make their stock look like Eastman Color, yeah. if they could. Mm -hmm. So there was very, a very subtle difference between them. It was cheaper, yeah. <laughs> which meant quite a bit to the production. Yeah. But I was never told that I had to f film it on f Fuji. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, before we wrap up, hmm. is, is there anything, any other comments, anything else you'd like to say about kind of working uh, during that period? Um, well, uh, yeah. Any influences on you, sort of, in those early years on your filmmaking? Or I think that colour, at least to start with, was much more difficult than black and white. Yeah. Uh, there were so many, in, in with black and white, redu you re reduce the world to shapes mm. and light, and in colour, well, there's so many, to, it's, it's stating the obvious, but color, color leaps forward, uh, leaps out at you. And you need to, it's useful if you can control the colors within the set. It's not always possible to do that. So it, it's taken a while for us all to, to master it and underst understand it. I think if in, in 50 years time, when we look back on, on this period, we'll, we'll see that uh, the, the early films in colour, uh, even putting aside the fact that there's a problem with the change of the shift of colours in the print, it's taken quite a while for colour to look good mm. in, in many films, in gen generally good. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of very bad examples of the use of colour uh, in the first 20 years of, of Eastman colour. Mm. Technicolour is another matter, I think we should put that into a different category because mm -hmm. it, it needed, it, it favoured the stylized approach, it needed a lot of light because it was so slow, but the naturalistic use or even the dramatic use of a faster colour stops was not really mastered well until the, towards the end of the, the, the film period and the beginning of the digital period. Mm -hmm. There are some many no noble and notable examples, exceptions to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm a very good use of colour, yes. of course there are. Mm -hmm. But it is more difficult than, than black and white yes. to, to control. And just to finish, so you, but you always had a fondness for the stock you were using sort of in the, the 60s, which I believe was 5254. Uh, and that rings a bell, yes. Yes. Yeah, I, d I drifted back to it as often as possible, mm. uh, even though once one gets used to the fast stock, it's a struggle to shoot with less sensitivity. It really is much more effortful, but it paid back and it looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly looking back at Privilege now, it's, it's just a beautifully shot film. Ah. And the colours are perfect in the film, yeah. so I can see why <laughs> there was a fondness for mm. that particular stock. Mm -hmm. so. Well, you didn't have a choice then, anyway. No, no, no of course. Um, okay, well, thank you, Peter. Okay. You're very welcome. <laughs>